Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfectionist where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our biochemistry playlist. In previous videos, we talked about enzyme kinetics, Michaelis Menten, and Lean Weaver Burke graphs. We talked about the effect of temperature, pH, and salinity on enzyme activity. Today, we'll talk about the regulation of enzyme activity, such as feed forward and feedback mechanisms. So, let's get started. Please watch the videos in my biochemistry playlist in order. Enzymes boost the speed of the reaction and they lower the activation energy making it easier for you to jump. But enzymes will not change and they are not consumed by the reaction. They will not change the equilibrium position, they will not change the thermodynamics or the overall delta G. Enzymes have a front door, the active site, and a back door, allosteric site. Here is a substrate and the enzyme before the reaction begins, and then after the reaction, boom, we have products instead of substrate. We talked about the key and lock model as well as the induced fit model before. Please pause and review. Today's topic is about the regulation of enzyme activity. We have feed forward and have feedback. Which one is more common? Of course, feedback. Indeed, feed forward is very rare. Okay, feedback. We have positive feedback and we have negative feedback. Which one is more common? Negative feedback is more common. Okay, metacosis, tell us about the negative feedback. Suppose that A led to B. So we have more B and more B and more B and more B as the reaction continues. This huge increase in B should shut off this reaction otherwise we're gonna explode. So when the rise in B decreases A or shuts off this process or this enzyme, this is negative feedback. Conversely, if decreasing B and decreasing B and decreasing, oh, we're gonna run out of B here. What should I do? Do the opposite. Negative feedback boost this reaction in order to give me more B. So when you have the arrows going in different directions, it's a negative feedback. But when the arrows are going in the same direction, whether upwards or downwards, it's a positive feedback. Example of positive feedback, A led to B, which led to more A, which led to more B, which led to more A, boom, we will explode. That's why positive feedback is rare, because it has explosive effects. Example of feed forward, which is rare. Here is X and then Y and then Z, and we have enzymes on the arrow. If X is boosting a process that is yet to come in the future, this is feed forward. But if X led to Y, led to Z, and then the increase in Z led to decrease in the enzyme before it, this is feed back. And this happens in your body all the time. Suppose that your pituitary gland secreted thyroid-stimulating hormone, which went to the thyroid gland and told the thyroid gland to secrete T3 and T4. Lots and lots and lots and lots of T3 and T4 in the blood, by negative feedback, will shut down the pituitary, which will shut down the thyroid gland as well, so that we might decrease T3 and T4 before we explode, before it gets out of hand. That's a negative feedback. Imagine this, high carbon dioxide, what should I do? I should do something to lower my carbon dioxide in the blood, such as hyperventilation. This is negative feedback, which is very common in the human body, otherwise I will die from too much carbon dioxide or hypercapnia. Positive feedback can destroy you because it has explosive effects. It's a vicious cycle that doesn't end. A increases B, which increases A, which increases B. This is explosive. There are few examples of positive feedback in the body. Example number one, bleeding. When you bleed, you activate your clotting factors, which will stimulate one another. Boom, 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 boom. And then you activate more so that you can stop the bleeding. Another example is the uterine contraction. Uterine contraction will push the fetus downwards, which stretches the cervix. The stretch of the cervix increases uterine contractions, which causes the fetus to descend more. Boom, 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 until pew, extrusion of the baby takes place. So let's recap, look at this. Do you think this is positive feedback or negative feedback? Well, an increase in Z led to decrease in the enzyme before it. We have opposite arrows, therefore it's a negative feedback. 
In the next video, we'll talk about competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. Before we do that, you need to master Michaelis Menten. Please refer to previous videos. Non-competitive inhibitors will lower my Vmax by decreasing the number of available enzymes. Competitive inhibitors, on the other hand, will increase my KM, which means decrease affinity between the enzyme and the substrate. Pause and review. You should also be able to do the same thing on the Lean Weaver Burke graph. Again, I have a separate video on this topic. In pharmacology, it's a similar story. Suppose that we have a substrate or a ligand that goes and activates this receptor. And I gave you a drug that also goes and activates your receptor. What do we call that? We call this an agonist. It's acting on the same receptor. How about an antagonist? Well, this is a drug that goes to the same receptor but inhibits it. So instead of having the same effect, you're having zero effect. Nothing. No effect. This drug can block the front door or the back door. If it blocks the front door, this is competitive inhibition. If it goes through the back door, this is non-competitive inhibition. Unfortunately, many students think that an antagonist will cause the opposite effect. Not true. The antagonist will cause no effect. Zero. Zip. Null. Nil. Even Ben Shapiro can tell you. Quote, the idea that antagonist to X cause opposite effect to X is absolutely asinine, okay, folks? You're confusing categories here. An antagonist is not the same as inverse agonist, okay? My wife is a doctor, and I'm a pharmacist now. Example, beta agonist should stimulate the beta receptor on the heart. What do you think a beta antagonist does? Some students will say, oh, it's gonna cause the opposite. Wrong. Beta blocker will cause nothing. So, if the beta agonist increases heart rate and stroke volume, what do you think beta blockers will do? They cause no increase in heart rate or stroke volume. But, but I thought that beta blockers decrease heart rate and stroke volume. Yeah, but you know who actually did it? The vagus nerve. Because when you block the beta, when you block the sympathetic, the only game in town left is the parasympathetic, which will decrease your heart rate and your stroke volume. So what beta blockers do is not to reverse the beta, but to stop the beta. How can I invest my money wisely? Warren Buffett answered, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. A medical student asked, how can I treat arrhythmia wisely? Rule number one, don't let the beta one get stimulated, i.e. give a beta blocker. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. So if this is my full agonist giving me 100% of the desired effect, an antagonist will give me zero. This is not the same as an inverse agonist or a super antagonist, which will take me to the negative territory. So antagonist equals zero, not the opposite. The antagonist is not the opposite of agonist. In the next video, we'll talk about competitive and non-competitive inhibition. For now, I just want you to remember that the competitive antagonist is the greedy capitalist and the non-competitive antagonist is Nancy the Karen. Why is that? You will discover in the next video. If you like this video, enjoy my toxicology course on my website. You can download it today. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here or by clicking on the thanks button. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study harder. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.